One thing you don't need while you go surfing is shoes. No, you don't. And our next guest loves shoes, and I love shoes as well, but I don't think as much as her. But she's a fascinating lady with a fascinating career. She's here to tell us all about it. It's Judith Fordham, the Associate Professor in Forensic Science at Murdoch University. She's also a barrister and an author, and she's here to tell us about her new book, Life, Law and Not Enough Shoes. Welcome to Wake Up WA. Thanks for having me. It's Good a morning, pleasure. Judith. It's an morning. absolute pleasure. Now, where do I start here? First of all, you, I understand that you're a mother of four, and when you were studying law, how did you manage to balance the two? Four young well, not children. Not only that, what motivates a single mother of four to go and start a law degree, yeah. let alone complete one? Uh, I'd like to say I had a burning desire to save the world and see justice done and things like that, but the truth of the matter is, was the only um, study the government would give me any money to, to do. And rather than sort of, you know, sitting at home and learning better ways of folding nappies and things like that, I thought I really wanted to learn something as well. So I sort of tucked one baby under the arm and uh, a couple of others in daycare and uh, off I went to law school. And, but how did you manage it though, like while well, with the study and everything? Um, lots of shortcuts. Any young mums want to give me a call, any shortcut. First thing, don't cook vegetables. They're much more nutritious if they're not cooked and you save the cooking time. <laughs> I could go on. God. <laughs> <laughs> so, from law, how did you find your way drifting into forensic science? Well, that's easy. Um, I was attracted to criminal law or it attracted me or something like that. So I was doing a lot of criminal law. And with the rise of forensic science, it became really obvious I needed to know a lot more about forensic science. I already had a science degree anyway before a law degree. So I trotted off to uh, UWA and uh, did forensic science. And uh, it's the most fascinating, fascinating thing in the entire universe. Because, of course, we've all watched CSI. It's all dead bodies and glamour, isn't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Some of it's boring. I really want to be on CSI, though, because of CSI, they get an unlimited shoe allowance. I'm sure they do. <laughs> and they're all incredibly beautiful, and they're at least six inches taller than me, the women, and a foot taller than me for the guys. And they have wonderful, glamorous lives, and I would love that. But, no, it's well, not like that. <laughs> but it is pretty interesting, pretty gory sometimes. How, how I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cutting on you. Annette. How close to the truth are those shows? Do you sit there and oh. cringe and go, oh, my goodness, that's wrong? Or, is, or are they getting a bit I more... really can't watch them, but they're good in their own sort of space because, uh, you know, people, for example, who are going to be jurors on trials will watch CSI and think, well, science isn't that scary, you know? I can, right. I can yeah. listen to that. I can, I can follow that. But they do have some silly things. On, like They've got this one where someone gets stabbed and they pour this fancy foam in the wound and it pulls out an exact replica of the knife. I uh, mean, no, nah, I don't <laughs> think so. So not an exact replica of a body cavity, which you'd actually get. Yeah, well, you, well it would, yeah, it would be the body cavity, yeah, which had nothing, nothing to do with a knife more than life. Yeah. Right. Now, and gross. So you must have lots and lots of these fascinating stories or things that, mm. you know, the average person just doesn't see in it every day. So you've written a book called Life, Law and Not Enough Shoes. Now, this is, these are all about most of your experiences. Within, yeah, a lot of yep. stories from 20 years as a criminal lawyer. You so need a lot of crazy A people. lot about crime. Now, I've heard this has got a bit of humour in it. How can you... <laughs> How can miserable crime stories be humorous? Where can, how can you find the funny side of it? Well, I think everybody in these sorts of jobs, they, they do find the funny side of it. You know, police have a very wicked, if not uh, strange, sense of humour. And uh, you know, forensic pathologists, the ones I know, have a pretty odd sense of humour too. And I think I'm part of that club. You've got to laugh, otherwise you're crying, you feel miserable and, you know. And so it's a coping mm. mechanism as much as anything else. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, it's genuinely funny. I mean, people who've been reading that book have been emailing me saying, look, I was laughing on the bus and people looking at me like I was weird, you know. Mm. So... There are truly funny things that happen. There's nothing better than a good laugh. But um, what, I was a bit interested. There's a few things that we're going to refer to in a second, but a little uh, anecdote I heard. Tell us a bit about the Jolly Green Giant and having to go <laughs> along to a bank with a yeah. prisoner in prison uniform. Well, there you go. You told my story. <laughs> oh, that told my story. That's it. I can go now. So you, yes. can do it. you can do my interview. Yes. Uh, no, I, I had this client who for reasons that are too long to go into now, had to come up with $10,000 before the judge was going to release him from custody. It was by way of a fine. He'd breached his bail and he had to hand the money over. And the only way to get the money was to go to the bank. And he, of course, was the one who had the card, but he was in prison. He was in custody. So he's in the court dressed in his green prison clothes. <coughs> excuse me. And uh, that, uh, you know, they're bottle green. They're horrible. They're not exactly fashion central. And uh, he looked like a prisoner. You know, 
every police officer, every lawyer knows what prison clothes looks like. And he had his thongs with, uh, you know, his tattoos on his toes. He had his knuckles with love and hate. And uh, the judge said, he's in your custody. Go get the money from the bank. Didn't send a police officer with me. No handcuffs, no pepper spray, no nothing. And he's about nine feet tall. It's like, what am I going to do? What if he runs away? And then we rocked in High Street, one o'clock in the afternoon, rocked into the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, we'd like $10,000 in cash, please. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, Taylor was looking worried, but we got the money. They handed the ten grand over in the end. After I said, "It's all right, I'm a barrister," and it's like as if that helps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a hostage, not really. A I'm not. <laughs> you know, like, what else would I say? And uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. That's cutting a longish story very short, but geez, it wasn't funny at the time. No, oh, totally. I, not a your heart would have been, been pounding. When you got home safely. Oh, yeah, well, I saw the judge socially later on, and I sort of said, how could you do that to me? And he said, you should have seen your face. <laughs> <laughs> but, so that's not your first brush with uh, the slightly illegal situations. Weren't you taken off a plane in the States as a suspected terrorist? <laughs> yes, that was scary. That was scary, too, because you know those American sort of you know, security guys are pretty scary people. Oh, I'm sitting <laughs> on a plane, you know, ready to fly somewhere and domestically in the US, and these marshals come in, and, you know, they're big guys, too, and they've got guns. Could Judith Fordham identify herself? Uh, it's me. And, uh, you know, could you get off the plane, madam? It's like, what? And down we go to my luggage. And my luggage is emitting this strange noise and vibrating slightly. I know, it's a G rating. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. okay. No one gets blown up. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're getting there too, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, there I am. And they've got luggage on the plane. I mean, it was a bomb. How stupid, leaving it under the plane anyway. Madam, you know, why is that noise happening? What's going on? And it turned out it was my electric toothbrush. Yeah. And it was... <laughs> my electric <laughs> toothbrush, okay? <laughs> but that was scary. Would have been scary for the, uh, for the security guards as well, I imagine. But they're pretty onto it these days, aren't they? You leave your bag they... alone for five seconds and they're onto it. Yeah, what they're doing though, I mean, they're about to load on the plane, they leave it under the plane. And if it had been a bomb, I mean, duh. Yeah, that's so a good legal phrase, duh. Maybe a, bomb, yeah. a, a bomb, so therefore, we'll, yeah, we'll store it underneath the aircraft while yeah. we ascertain what's going on. Yeah, and no, ask her to open it up. So these are the type. I did actually. <laughs> so they're the type of photos. Just, just, just quickly, this. this is the yeah. director of public um, prosecutions for WA. He's drinking Mr. out of Robert your Cox, shoe. You see? Yes. Can you that's see? It's that one right there. Why is he drinking out of your shoe? Uh, let's just say there was a social function on. And he, uh, we were talking about men who drink champagne out of women's shoes. And he basically said, well, I wouldn't be averse to that. So me, I said, okay, here's one, drink. And blow me down, he did. I poured the champagne, it wasn't real champagne because that would be a waste. I poured the champagne in the shoe. And he drank uh, And he drank, but first I said, someone get a camera. Yeah. And to his internal credit, he's allowed me to print that in the book, which I think shows he's got quite a sense of humour. Mm. So just and, quickly... And red eyes as well. <laughs> Before we finish, where did this shoe fetish come? And we have to head a, a quick shot of your shoes because they're absolutely fascinating. Where did this sh- love of shoes come from? I'm a girl. <laughs> what more do you want? You know, I didn't know they're going to match your shag pile give rug, me, give though. A bit of a wiggle you could have so told me. Uh, Look, uh, they're... Just had them there. Are they cute? Are they cute? I think they're you, gorgeous. You've, you've worn you've zebra print shoes in a courtroom. You've represented yeah. bikies, transsexuals. This, I've got to have a bit of a read of this because I had a bit mm. of a skim through and uh, everything I caught that caught my eye is interesting. You've, uh, you've been through some trials and tribulations. What's, what's next? TV deal? Movie? Well, people are actually talking to me about possibly a television series. Wouldn't Ooh. that be wonderful? Well, I like drinking I champagne, so I'll play Robert Cock, all right? We'll no <laughs> worries. <laughs> we'll get better champagne for you. So where can people find out more information? Uh, they can go to my website. It's probably the easiest. That's www.judithfordham.com.au. Beautiful. It's Fordham with an H, people. Yes. Yeah. Well, it sounds like those stories in that, that book are absolutely fascinating. So, and your life has just been fascinating, so it just makes a perfect book. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm-hmm. And good luck with um, the future, like, especially with the, with the possible TV series. I should get your autograph now. Actually, we should get you to sign a book. Absolutely. Yeah, I can do that. Mm. Maybe even give one away to our viewers. More yeah, information at wakeupwa.com.au. We need to go to a quick mm-hmm. break before we get into trouble. When we come back, Ainsley Gatt talks to us about Friends of the Art Gallery. Don't go anywhere. You're on Wake Up WA.